DLC, or downloadable content, is a small paid-for expansion to a video game. Maybe it's a few new levels, maybe it's a playable character, maybe it's a birthday party for a murderer. But as the Scottish poet Robert Burns famously wrote, the best laid schemes of mice and men gang off de glay. And while we don't know what a glay means, we do know that occasionally the scope for a piece of DLC balloons out of control, to the point where the developers are left with little choice but to make that DLC a whole game unto itself. And what was once DLC becomes an entire sequel. Aha! I looked it up. It means a brand of sunglasses that became very popular in the early noughties. That's Oakley. Hmm. Must have been a sponsorship thing. Nice one, Robert Burns. Get that bag. When the sequel to Breath of the Wild was first announced, the world, how to put this, lost its sh and not surprising when Breath of the Wild turned out to be such a fun and brilliant game. It also had some fun DLC, such as the Master Trials, which had new modes and side quests, and the Ballad of Champions, which offered a prologue to the game's story, as well as a frickin' motorbike. Uh, more of that please, Nintendo. And indeed, Nintendo did have more of that. So much so that it congealed and evolved into a whole dang sequel. Speaking to Kotaku in 2019, Zelda series producer Eiji Aonuma shared that they had so many more concepts in mind that just adding DLC wouldn't cut it. Initially, we were thinking of just DLC ideas, but then we had a lot of ideas and we said, this is too many ideas. Let's just make one new game and start from scratch. According to Aonuma, DLC was not enough for some of the mechanics that they had in mind. And so Breath of the Wild 2, aka Tears of the Kingdom, was born. Instead of some new DLC features that you only got after already finishing the game, players got a whole new adventure with a bunch of fun new characters, two entire new areas to explore, and, crucially, a buttload of new abilities for Link right from the beginning of the game. Tears of the Kingdom was a reimagining of Breath of the Wild's Hyrule from the underground up, and had a very different ethos when it came to the way it should be played, with the devs turning debug features like the power to teleport through the ceiling into actual features and saying wild forbidden things like cheating can be fun. And so while Breath of the Wild hit the cool motorbike right at the end of the DLC, in Tears of the Kingdom players could build a hoverbike and glide about Hyrule minutes after starting the game. And to that I say, top work, no notes. To say that Hollow Knight Silk Song is a sequel that started as DLC is technically speculation, since at the point of recording, the game still isn't out yet. And going by past form, it's entirely possible that when it does finally, finally arrive after a slew of delays, Silk Song will not be just a sequel to the hit indie Metroidvania Hollow Knight, but also an opera, an epic poem, a year-long yoga retreat, and the great American novel, such as developer Team Cherry's propensity for letting projects get out of hand. Ah! Hollow Knight itself was released in 2017, three years after getting funded on Kickstarter. One stretch goal of that Kickstarter was a feature that added a second playable character. As Team Cherry explained in a Silk Song developer diary in 2019, that would have involved adding needle and thread wielding Hollow Nest defender Hornet to Hollow Knight as a playable character. And it was very early on intended as a DLC. So specifically, Hornet and what became Hollow Knight Silk Song started as a stretch goal on the Kickstarter for the game Hollow Knight, which is right at the end of 2014. So a very long time ago. And the goal for that was a playable Hornet. The team considered the ability to swap between the Knight character and Hornet, or a distinct Hornet chapter, before settling on the third option, create an entirely new game for Hornet at massive expense. A decision motivated by Team Cherry's urge to create an entire new explorable world for Hornet and her unique set of acrobatic powers, and also by the fact that... We have no idea how to make DLC for a game, <laughs> and it seems like a weirdly complicated thing. 
Presumably not as complicated as turning the idea of playable Hornet into a gigantic standalone adventure, one that remains one of the most anticipated unreleased titles in video games. At the time of recording, there's been no update on Silk Song's release since May of 2023, and it's not clear how much longer there is to wait. Although if anything is going to drag Silk Song kicking and screaming into the real world, it'll be us publishing this video where we spend a whole list entry describing it as unreleased. And if that's the case, well, you're welcome. Assassin's Creed Mirage is an homage to Assassin's Creed 1, and not just because it was kinda mid and could be improved upon with a sequel. Mirage goes back to the original Middle Eastern setting where the series began and trims back the RPG elements of the later games, aiming to recreate the game structure and feel of the original parkour-focused sneaky stabby assassinations. So it may surprise some of you watching to find out that it was originally DLC for the open-world RPG-heavy Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Creative director Stéphane Boudon told Game Informer that Valhalla protagonist Eivor was originally going to be the playable character, travelling to the Middle East far from their English home. But the Ubisoft Bordeaux team smashed the pitch harder than a Viking stoving in an enemy's skull, and mere weeks into the DLC project, they got the go-ahead to make Mirage into a whole standalone game with a whole new lead character. who Valhalla players will recognise as Ivor's helper from the Brotherhood, Basim. But you must learn how to use it effectively. Some fans believe that this isn't the first time this happened, with many speculating that the second and third games in the Ezio trilogy were DLCs that grew into full games. But this has never been confirmed by Ubisoft the way that Mirage was. Nowhere left to run now! Not for me, and not for you. Our theory is that they just wanted to spend more development time gazing at Ezio. Don't blame them. They say honesty is the best policy, but is that actually good advice, or does it just sound smart because it rhymes? Halo and Destiny developer Bungie would have reason to doubt the usefulness of that idiom if its memory stretches back to 2008 when, following the release of Halo 3, publisher Microsoft revealed Halo 3 Recon, an expansion to Halo 3 that would boast a short campaign with a new playable character. Recon was never envisioned at the time to be anything like a full-sized game, and the studio was very upfront about that back then, with Bungie telling Game Informer, we do not view this as a $60 title. Which is a fine and honest thing to say, right up to the point where you find yourself needing to charge $60 for the game. Which was indeed the price tag when Halo Recon launched in 2009 as a fully-fledged standalone game, retitled to Halo 3 ODST, which stands for Orbital Drop Shock Troopers, one of whom you ended up playing as. Reflecting in 2010, Bungie veteran Joseph Stanton said that ODST started as an expansion but over time evolved into a full-featured beast that we could all stand behind at the $60 price point. Although ODST reviewed well, Stanton also speculated in a separate interview that it's impossible to know but my gut says that if we had never said the words expansion pack we would have seen an appreciable increase in the review scores. A sobering lesson in the dangers of open and honest communication. Sometimes games have such a strong creative direction that you'd assume that its creators clearly knew what they wanted it to be from the start. Just look at GTA Vice City. Full of 80s vibes and gangsters in Hawaiian shirts, it has such a solid sense of what it is that you'd be astounded to find out that it actually started out as a mission pack for GTA 3. Talking to Digital Trends in 2012, 10 years after Vice City's release, Rockstar producer Leslie Benzies shared how the best-selling game of 2002 actually came about while working on a port for its predecessor. We did not really sit down with the intention of making a sequel. After we released GTA 3, 
2023, we spent a few months working on the PC version and then started thinking about things we could put in a mission pack. We realized that there was too much stuff for a mission pack and that it should probably be its own game. Considering Vice City features an entire new city, I can understand why it might have been too much work for a DLC. It was still a lot of work for a roughly one year development cycle, but the developers managed to get it done, with Benzies noting, We were all on quite a high from finishing GTA 3, and I think we all wanted to see where we could take the concept. So the core of the game started falling into place quite quickly. But more recently, in 2023, in a since deleted blog post, former Rockstar technical director Obi Vermey said that the decision to make Vice City into a full game was made six months into development, after GTA 3 did so well and Vice City started to look so different from Liberty City. The fact that this game grew from DLC to full game mid-production is wild, and probably not great for avoiding developer crunch overworking, with Vermeer noting, everybody just powered through on adrenaline, but it became clear that we needed a bit more of a gap for the next game. They seem to have taken that to heart. It's been, what, like five years since the last GTA game? Ten, actually. What? <laughs> <laughs> You're late. I thought you were professional. Oh, you should relax. You'll live longer. Nathan Drake, hero of Uncharted, is many things. Debonair, adventurous, intelligent. But one other thing he is, is absolutely knackered. After four games of upper arm ruining escapades, who could blame him? And so, were he real, he would probably be quite relieved to find that upon the release of Uncharted 4 in 2016, developer Naughty Dog found the demands of making The Last of Us Part 2 meant there weren't enough resources to commit to an Uncharted 5. Lucky for you, Nate. Yep. The challenge, however, was that people liked Uncharted and were willing to exchange money for more of it. So Naughty Dog originally hatched a plan for Uncharted 4 DLC, something that could be cooked up within a year and with a fresh protagonist. Reportedly, Naughty Dog briefly considered Nate's best friend Sully, but didn't love the idea of young Sully, which it would have to be in order for the character to do any kind of ludicrous climbing without his knees shattering permanently at the first jump. Which, to be fair, would have kept things short. Naughty Dog settled on series stalwarts Chloe Fraser and Nadine Ross for the DLC's protagonists, but in what is becoming a theme in this video, development got out of hand. And the axe. Shiva. Game director Kurt Marginot told Game Informer, We tried to keep it small, but as we started coming up with story ideas, it just became clear that with new characters and in this genre of Uncharted, it has to be big. You take left, yeah, I take I right. Remember. <gasps> what the? <laughs> that works too. The result was The Lost Legacy, about as expansive as an expansion can be, telling a roughly eight-hour, action-packed story that ended up going on sale as a standalone game, rather than the Uncharted 4 DLC originally envisioned. It turned out pretty great, plus gave Chloe Fraser a chance to take the lead on a treasure hunt, though we have to wonder if Nate misses all this. <laughs> Probably not. Many companies will make an April Fool's announcement only to turn around and go, actually, that's a good idea, let's do it. Then there's Volition. On the 1st of April 2012, the developer of the Saints Row series announced new DLC, Saints Row the Third, Enter the Dominatrix. What exactly is Enter the Dominatrix? Oh man. Are we really digging that up? In a press release that can still be found in Game Informer's April Fool's 2012 roundup, it boasted all new abilities and powers for players to muck about with, such as mind-bending telekinesis, really, really high jump, really, really fast sprint, shiny blue force field, and shiny blue fireball projectile of doom. That sounds very silly, but also kind of fun. Volition evidently thought so too, as just over a month later in May 2012, they revealed that their April Fool's joke was in fact going to become real DLC, so it was retroactively some kind of double mega April Fool's that would cost $29.99. But then, just one month later, publisher THQ announced that this Enter the Dominatrix expansion would now be merged with the next Saints Row sequel, 
Why? Because THQ president Jason Rubin really loved the DLC, and yes, we can quote him on that because he made an actual statement. When I looked at the Enter the Dominatrix expansion in production at Volition, I was blown away by the ideas and desire to expand the fiction of the franchise. Enter the Dominatrix will now be incorporated into a vastly expanded, full-fledged sequel scheduled for calendar 2013. So the wild superpowers from one silly expansion pack became the foundational mechanics of Saints Row 4, which explains a lot about that game really. For anyone missing the specifically SM themed dominatrix stuff implied by the original April Fool's gag, don't worry, it reappeared as DLC for Saints Row 4. You think I'll go down that easily? <laughs> now that's what I call a happy ending. Wait, no, 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 not like that. No, no, stop it. Worst idea we've ever had. So those are some examples of sequels that in the beginning in the, in the start, when they were just a little little twinkle in a studio's eye, were mere simple, lovely DLC. Can you think of any other examples? If so, let us know in the comments. Maybe we'll uh, shout you out in a commenter edition of this video. And hey, if you did enjoy this, why not go the optional extra mile in supporting the video work that we do by clicking on the square somewhere around here that has all of our faces on it. It will take you to a Patreon page, for a Patreon is a thing that we have. And if you join it, you can get access to a Discord where we all hang out and chat about video games and other stuff besides. And it's a good time. All right, thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye.